So we need to talk about questions, and I guess the third, first one should be the, the question about the mosquitoes. Um, I don't exactly know 100% how to respond to that because mosquitoes are where they are. They don't come to areas because, they're, because there are tall plants. The tall plants provide a place for them to hide. So what probably has happened is that you live in an area where there are lots more mosquitoes than there could be because maybe it's because there's poor drainage or whatever. I mean, I don't know. It depends on that area. But the bigger problem is, or at least part of the problem, I think the bigger problem is that the things that would be eating those mosquitoes are not in that landscape. So you've created this situation happily where butterflies can live and birds can live and that sort of thing, but it also is a landscape where the mosquitoes can live. So what you have to do to get rid of those is you have to talk to your neighbors and have them plant some habitat too because as there's more habitat, more of life will come into balance and you won't have that problem. Until then, I guess you just have to get some off. I'm sorry, I mean, I really... Or bats, but, you know, that's the thing, we'll just bring, you know, can you just bring bats into your yard? I mean, I don't know where you live, but if there's not enough habitat to sustain bats or bluebirds, I mean, you're not going to have bluebirds if you live in town, bluebirds or whoever eats those, if you don't have enough habitat, just you and your yard is not going to be enough to attract them. That's why I talk about butterflies and, and smaller insects. We all can do that. We all can plant a spice bush, the spice bush swallowtail. It's bigger if we want to have box turtles and foxes in our backyard. We can do it, but you guys have to do it as a neighborhood. Just you are not enough. So, it is, you know, it's, it's, it's a tricky situation. I think one point you touched on is important is from the water conservation standpoint because a lot of these natives are adjusted to our rain cycles here and they don't require as much artificial water and they will survive the drought. Yes, exactly right. Thank you very much. Right now, you know how dry it is. I mean, everywhere. You guys had a rain that we didn't have in north of Frankfurt. And if you drive alongside, there are Jerusalem artichokes this tall and full, beautiful, vibrant blooms because they have roots that go down to China and they have big, thick tubers that support them. Native plants, by and large, are hardy, drought tolerant, etc. But you can't take a plant out of a wetland and bring it out in the full blazing sun and clay, you know, so it's, you know, you have to use your common sense, although you can push the envelope. And the other thing is, Rarely, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've grown them in nurseries, I've grown them at home, I plant them in people's landscapes. I can't say rarely, I, I can actually say never have I seen a native plant destroyed by insects. Never. It's just not a problem. They get aphids, you know, those um, um, honeysuckles. I have them growing at my house and they get aphids on them, something awful in the spring. And I used to spray them with soapy water, and then one year I was busy and I didn't. And then I noticed after a few weeks they just disappeared because the insects ate them up. You know, I just hadn't been patient enough. Yes, they looked ugly for a while. Yes, they set the blooming time back, but didn't even come close to destroying them. Maybe they would in your backyard because I live in the country. I have lots of habitat naturally, which I've augmented, but so I have that balance more than some of us do in urban areas. So if it looks like your plants are being destroyed, maybe you want to, you know, pick some of those caterpillars off and take them and put them in your neighbor's yard or something. You know, I don't, <laughs> however you want to deal with it. But still, even, you know, I've worked a lot in Lexington and in Frankfurt and even in urban areas, I just don't see the plants destroyed by insects. They're tough. If you talk a little bit, I mean, my front yard's toast, and I don't particularly want to have grass there yet. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about front yard plants, because I know size is an issue? Uh, yes, I'm very glad you said that. I'm very glad you said that, because it reminds me of two things that, you see, because I, I follow the script for the first page, and then I just let it, you know, I was going to talk about that. Um, flowers are fine, but they're much more difficult, because you have to do your research, and something that's this tall in nature 
and I'm not exaggerating, I promise, columbines, like this tall in nature, I plant them in somebody's landscape, they're this tall. Sometimes I plant three of them, two of them are this tall and one's this tall. They're very hard to, um, to guess what they're gonna be like. So, given that, if you're creating a rain garden or if you're creating a landscape in your front yard or even in your backyard, if you want it to be a little more controlled, plant trees and shrubs. Trees and shrubs are very much more predictable. They're also less expensive because one goes a long way generally, you know, because they take up a lot more space. And then include a few flowers. Get to know them, and as you get to know them, and as you have time to do more research, add more in. This is why I tell people, you know, instead of planting a rain garden, plant a rain forest. Put mostly maybe one or two trees, some shrubs in there, a few flowers for color and then go from there, um, at, you know, just the same as with the front. Now, I'm not saying don't put perennials in there. I'm just saying do your research first, particularly if it's in the front yard. It's not gonna help anybody if somebody in this neighborhood plants a front yard with native plants and puts a sign up that says rain garden and it looks like the Dickens, because who's gonna wanna do that? We need our neighbors to do it, right? So we want to encourage them by having a beautiful rain garden. And then another thing along with, with that, if you have a rain garden, you know, it needs to be 10 feet from your house. If you have a rain garden, um, particularly if it's in your front yard, it's 10 feet away from your house, what are you gonna do between the house and where the rain garden starts? I'm you need drive to- my truck. Hey, park your truck. Is it? I'm gonna drive my truck through there. I gotta have a way to get the driveway. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, depending on where you are, you can do that. But if you just have grass, what you're gonna have is plop in the middle of your yard this perennial garden or rainforest or whatever. Try to embed your rain garden into a bigger landscape, you know, whether it's flowers, whether it's trees, whether it's just mulched and you put a bird bath or a sitting area or something. You know, you don't want to just go out in the middle of your yard and draw out a circle and plant a flower garden. So you don't want to do that with your rain garden. You want to see it as an element of your landscape and incorporate it in, you know, whatever way you decide to do that. But to keep that in mind, particularly if it's in the front yard, it's very important. It's not that hard to do. So Connie, those of us who are just now dabbling into this arena, and you be the expert, how do we get connected with folks who have experience to help guide us in this? I should have told you to ask me that. That's a perfect question. <laughs> um, what a segue. <laughs> Well, you know, if I was a good business person, like, like I'm not, I would say, well, you can call me and hire me. And, but, the, but the reality is I, I seldom work in Lexington because I love my home of Frankfurt and I try to stay there. But if you can't find somebody to help you, you certainly can call me. Or, you know, better yet, what I like people to do and it's free, just email me and say, you know, what do you think about this thus and so? I'll be happy to respond to you or call me. And I'm on here of the sources. The other thing that's on here with the sources is, um, Wild Ones Natural Landscapers, which is kind of like a garden club, but all the people who are members are interested in learning about native plants. Um, there are several designers in our group. The president right now is a landscape designer who's learning more about native plants. And there are people who don't have any natives in their yard but are interested in learning. Um, the website's on here. We have our meeting, I think it's this Thursday, and Dave Leonard, who is an arborist here in Lexington, is coming to talk about planting native plants in your garden, ma'am. I think it's at the Arboretum. I think it's at the Arboretum. I never find out until like five minutes before I need to leave my house. So that's a good website that's on here. The other thing I would encourage you to do is to go to Shooting Star Nursery, um, Salado, and look at some plants. You know, see how they look. Shooting Star particularly has a lot of them planted out in their landscape, and you can see what they look like growing in the landscape. That's the problem with these natives. If I say to you marigold, that makes a picture in your mind because you know what it looks like, or a rose or whatever. If I say to you purple leaf thimbleberry, but if I say that and you've been to Shooting Star and you see how beautiful they are and those lovely big purple flowers and the neat fruits that come on them, boom, oh, I want one of those. So you just really have to educate yourself, but it's so much worth it. Um, I don't know if there's anything else I need to say about that. One yes, thing sir? I would like to do in the native plant arena is point out places 
that people can go to see. Betty Botkin, you know? Betty Botkin? Yeah. Is that, I think oh, that, Banna, Banna Popkins. Popkins. Yes. Okay. Um, Betty Popkin. I can't wait to tell her you said that. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, on Idaho. Is one place. He but is. I'd like from you all, where are places people can go to see native plants in the landscape? Idea. Yes, uh, I am so glad you said that because that's something I've been talking about that we need to do as a group in Wild Ones is to have a list of public places where you can actually go and see those. If you email me, I will e I will give you Betty Hall, Betty and Harry Hall's phone number, and you can call her. Betty is tremendously generous. She's even probably more passionate about native plants than I am, if you can imagine such a thing, and she will be happy to have you come to her yard. Also, Wild Ones, we do garden tours. Um, Beata Popkins, if you come to the Wild Ones meeting, is a member there. I don't think she would want you just to show up and wander around her yard in the same way Betty would, but I think she'd be happy if, you know, to give you her number. And I haven't checked with her about that, but I know Betty will. Um, also, Beata's Church, which is on um, Fiddlesticks. Um, I can't remember. I'll try to think of it in a minute where it is, but at any rate, they have a huge retention, is it retention or detention? Huge, big retention, detention basin, which she's planted with native plants. Belafonte. It's, no, it's at the corner of Belafonte and something else, I think. Is that it? What church? Any? Church. Yes, the Episcopal Church. Is it Belafonte? It's on Belafonte. And there, you know, it's a church you can just go and walk in there. Problem is, they're not all labeled. But you can see them, and then you can call me or Beata or somebody and say, oh, I saw this big thing blooming in September. What is it or something? And truly, I do, I do mean that. I mean, I, we all need to do this, so please feel free to call me or email me anytime. How do, how do native gardens and, and vegetable gardens, do they go? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The, the nice thing is that <clears throat> native plants harbor beneficial insects. And actually, I have a friend in Frankfurt who does a huge organic garden. He makes sauerkraut. Um, anyway, and he has strips for beneficials, and I have planted some of those strips in native plants for that very reason, because the beneficial insects are predators on the insects that eat the plants, and so they'll come in. And also the birds. You know, you want more birds in your garden to eat those insects up. You've talked a number of times about wildlife, bringing wildlife into the neighborhood. We already have a possum, groundhog, and raccoons. Talk to me about that. That's a wonderful question. Thank you. And I, I kind of hesitate sometimes using that wildlife because I think people think about that. The reason we see lots of those things, like you, you, you know, you've heard, well, at, at the end of the world, there will always be possums and cockroaches. <laughs> it's probably true. You know, they'll be here after we are. Those things are here anyway doesn't matter if you have a land, natural landscape or don't have a natural landscape, you're going to have those. I have a friend I planted an Oscar, I planted a huge garden for, and he has a vegetable garden and always complains to me because those darn rabbits, and I said, Oscar, you had those rabbits before I planted your natural landscape. <laughs> so it's really, you know, if you have a vegetable garden and you have problems with those things, you're going to have problems with or without, you just have to fence it. You know, there's really, I don't think they help to deter them. Some people think, oh, if I plant in, you know, a natural landscape, they'll have more to eat, particularly deer. You know, people tell me that. I say no. It just, it just simply doesn't work. Those are, those are things that are generalist. So that's why we see them, because they can live in these unnatural conditions that we have created, whereas things like box turtles, and, you know, foxes I use as an example. You might see them in urban areas occasionally, but if you do, it's a point of celebration. Whereas a possum, which I particularly actually love, but...